Hello, friends. Welcome. It's Monday. It is half past eight, my time, PM, GMT, BST. Welcome. We're going to talk about the history news as we do on a Monday. And uh, it's lovely to see people already in the chat waiting for me. So let's say hello to some people. Hello, Sarah. I'm very pleased that you've made it down to a live. Thank you ever so much for making the time. Chrissy, you're watching this on the playback, and as with everybody else who's watching on the playback, I hope you will enjoy this stream. And as for Chrissy, I do hope that you feel much better very soon. Pretty pick, thank you. Lovely to see you, and I uh, hope you can stay for as long as you can, and that your class goes well when you have to head off that way. Happy Anzac Day. Was that Merry Anzac Day? How does one? Uh, say that. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth, for making it to a live. I hope you will enjoy this one. Alberta, hello, good evening, good morning, wherever, whatever time of day it is for you. It's lovely to see you here. Marianne, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Carol, and Happy Navajo Nation Sovereignty Day. Wonderful. Thank you all. Oh, it's just been done a big skip. Uh, are we saying there's no sound? Can other people hear me? I do hope so. The, sh the sound should be on. Uh, oh, lovely. Thank you. Sound accidentally muted. Thank you for letting me know. And, oh, my goodness, Carve Felum, you actually got notified. My goodness gracious. Does it mean, mate, I'm not sure, you know what? I am not going to curse it. Got the lovely, I've got the husband just reminding me of important things. And I'm going to say, I'm going to flag it up now. We have recently been going live every Monday. As we enter May, as in next month, we are going to be going fortnightly because an exciting thing begins on the 1st of May. So I won't be here next Monday. I will be here the Monday after and I won't be here the one after that, but I'll be here the one after that. Thus, fortnightly, <laughs> which is what I said in the first place. But I reiterated it as if you didn't know <laughs> what that meant. <laughs> it's been a long day um, because I have been doing the exciting thing or at least I've been preparing for the exciting thing that means that I will not be here next Monday. I will be telling you that at the very end of this video, it's going to be the last thing I talk about. So that is a reason to stick around or indeed, if you can't, to watch it on the playback. It Pretty big. It does not, in my case, have anything to do with Morris dancers. We, we are not, I'm not Morris dancing. I have two left feet, neither of them belong to me. So we have lots of news. We have, of course, updates. We have new news. We have our repatriation slash decolonization section. We have, I said new news. We also have one ding dong. I'm going to be honest, the ding dong, I was going to say something in a way that would have sounded very, very vulgar. Oh, what is, do we not use the term fortnight in the USA? Fortnight is two weeks, as in 14 nights. Thus, thus we, uh, I did not know. My husband's laughing at me. I can hear him laugh cackling downstairs. He's watching this I and I can hear him laughing because I've used the term fortnight, thinking that everybody knows what that is. But it's a weird, it's a weird Brit thing, isn't it? It's one of those weird Brit things. So we will also be the ding dong. The phrase I'm going to use. Stop laughing. Can you hear him cackling? The the, the phrase I'm going to use to, that, that came into my head that I thought I probably shouldn't say that, but I'm going to, was we have a ding dong, but it's kind of a bit of a surreptitious ding dong. And I've just sort of slipped it in there. <laughs> it's... He just said, I thought you were going to say it's a bit of a stretch, <laughs> which it also is. I cannot believe we've just started. I've not even put a slide up and I'm already having a problem. 
So <clears throat> it is in the ding dong section, but I feel like if there was a different ding dong on offer, <laughs> I would have put that one in instead. Wow. We're going to get to it. You'll see. And then we also have events and exhibitions to discuss. Um, we we are going to jump straight in. And uh, I will be saving most of the puns for History After Dark. I'm sorry. It's just it came into my head. I've had a, I've had a very big, big day. So I'm going to try my very best to maintain my composure. But I'm a bit tired. So we are going to hop in. First of all, of course, we have to say our thank yous to everybody who very kindly sent me news items. And so we will start with that post haste. Wonderful. So thank you very much to Carve Phelan, to Jesse, Joseph, Anne, Joe, Yvonne, uh, crazy artist lady, just pop you in there because my face is in the way, to Mary, Carolyn, Terra or Tira, Verity, another cat, hello name twin, and also to Perpetual Mourner. We and I'm just, I've seen people already referencing it. At no point is any of this a drinking game. Same with History After Dark. Absolutely never a drinking game. I do not approve that message. But I also, you're, I'm assuming, I hope, adapt, all adults, so you can do whatever, whatever you see fit. Let us begin with our first update. So last week, we what was mentioned to me and what came up in the comments and chat was a discussion about Ivory Bangle Lady. Very kindly sent uh, resources connected to Ivory Bangle Lady, which I uh, am showing you the headlines of them here. That is right at the top. As per usual, we have an opera pin board that you can go to that's linked in the description box. We also have a list of articles and appropriate links linked in the description box as well. And they helpfully have been numbered. You will notice that at the bottom of this slide, there is the number one. If you look in the description box, you will see that the links connected to Ivory Bangle Lady are helpfully also labeled number one. And thus, it should be fairly simple to use, I hope. So we are going to head on to our next update. I, I can see quite a lot of people talking about Fortnite and bi-weekly and bi-monthly. And do you know what? I'm not even going to, I'm not going to get involved in that discussion as to what bi-monthly means, whether it means every two months, twice a month, every other month. It, very confused. We have an update on this um, spectacular moment from, from the past, whereby the individual who snapped the thumb off of an incredibly important 2,000-year-old terracotta warrior whilst at some Christmas party, I believe. I think it was an ugly sweater Christmas party, if memory serves, whilst drunk. We have what's going on here. Um, the individual in question has now pled guilty. Why is this frozen? That's not helpful. Um, the, the individual in question has pled guilty and I'm just going to restart this because I need to be able to see it and it's too small on my screen. And that isn't just an eyesight thing. The uh, little window, so I can see the chat as well, is very, is very small. There we go. That's better. So Michael Rohana, 29 now, has pled guilty. We... He testified in his trial. He told jurors that he panicked after the thumb snapped off in his hands. This is why we look with our eyes and not with our hands, Michael. His response to this was to put it in his jeans pocket and then hide it in a desk drawer at his parents' house where he lived. The FBI showed up. Can you? He must have been absolutely sweating bullets. He told the jury, quote, I don't know why I broke it. It didn't just happen, but there was never a thought of I should break this. I think it's probably, my friend, the beers. <laughs> Maybe no more of those. Prosecutors initially charged Rahana with federal art theft. This, this is, I think, for people who are genuinely like art heisting, etc. 
and Rahana's lawyers, who are public defenders, said that this was prosecutorial overreach. Quote, these charges are made for art thieves. Think Ocean's Eleven or Mission Impossible. I'm sure real life art thieves also available could have been quoted, but let's make it Hollywood. Um, Catherine C. Henry said that, quote, Rohana wasn't in ninja clothing sneaking around the museum. He was a drunk kid in a bright green, ugly Christmas sweater. And I, I, I see the point that she's making that this is perhaps not something that should be covered under the federal art theft statute. That's perhaps a little bit over the top. Jurors said they were confused by the conflicting testimony and over the value of the broken thumb. Art appraisers for testifying for the government and for the defence are unable to agree whether the thumb met the $5,000 threshold to constitute a felony crime. Well, how, how, how much would one... Um, how much would a terracotta thumb be? Priceless is what I would go with. His guilty plea to one misdemeanor account of trafficking in archaeological resources, which is a charge much close to what his attorneys have previously argued was appropriate, negates the need for a second trial. As he did for much of his first trial, Rahana said little in court, sat between his lawyers at the defence table and answered questions from the US District Judge Chad F. Kennedy. His family sat behind him, we're told, in the courtroom gallery. Uh, they and Rohana have declined to comment after the proceedings concluded. He will return to court to face sentencing on August the 17th. And so thus, we will have an update for that I would imagine at some point. Just quickly, Brian, no, it moved to Thursday last week. It will be on Wednesday this week. History of Stark will be on Wednesday this week. And then we will be having a small break before returning. We will keep, we will keep you all up to date if you can follow us on the social media. We have an update. And I think I either I missed this when I was reading through the article or they buried the lead when they were talking about, and I thought it was called cool, the article that we saw last week, where they were talking about, go online, see if your ancestors can be found in the silhouettes. Cool story. I don't remember any reference to poison. Feel like they buried the lead here. So this is the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery. This is a 19th century album featuring 2,000 paper portrait silhouettes. That's like a tongue twister. Included in there are um, paper portrait silhouettes whoo, of George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. In 2008, we are told there was an unwelcome surprise. Conservationists discovered the album's pages and binding were contaminated with arsenic, which is literally the flavour <laughs> profile of the 1800s. So unsurprised, to be honest. Thus, the they determined that it could not be safely handled, nor could it be shared with visitors without essentially treating it as a hazardous material. Now, of course, it's been digitised and the links are all below. So if you do want to go and check it out and see if you can find family members that you may be able to find in this document, you can do it without you know, coming into contact with arsenic. I, my understanding is the real problem is inhaling it or licking it. So I don't know why they can't trust members of the public with that, although I suppose it's it's better to be safe than sorry. We are told that in sharing this work with the wider public, namely through this website, the curators hope to reveal even more about the subjects, the vast majority of whom were not notable figures, rather everyday people. This is a time when photography would have been decades away. And so these silhouettes are the first opportunity for people to have pictures of themselves and of loved one. We have, quote, we're hoping that as people do the genealogy, relatives can contact us. And if museum collections have unidentified silhouettes, they may be able to identify them by looking at this album. So that is lovely. And the arsenic is... Um, something that is just an added bonus an added risk it's it's the it's the element of jeopardy that we like in historical news we have um daria after the thumb thing i don't trust the public not to lick it i mean fair's fair fair's fair sarah and just imagine the lawsuits is also a good point if someone did something um 
I mean, who knows? If it if it became aerosolized, people did get sick in Victorian homes because of the arsenic in the wallpaper. If this were perhaps not climate controlled, if it became damp and it became aerosolized, that could definitely be a big pro big huge problem. Uh, or equally, Kay, good point. I I myself have also never been tempted to lick an artwork. N never. And uh, Carol, yes, digitised artwork, what a concept are you listing, British Museum? Here's the fun fact. The British Museum have an incredible digitised collection of documents and artworks. They have an incredible collection of, of photographs and, and full scans in high definition colour of incredible documents. They already have it. They've done it. <laughs> um. And I'm not going to put that on screen, Crazy Arse Lady, because I have a feeling that YouTube will immediately yeet this into the sun. I I see, I thought that too, but they did used to put arsenic on their faces quite a lot, which I, I doubt was wonderful for you, but didn't seem to be massively fatal in the sort of same doses as inhaling it or, for that matter, licking it. But... I, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend rubbing arsenic all over your thing, skin. So so there you go. We are moving straight on to repatriations and decolonization. I got sent this article a lot. It was not the one I got sent the most. We'll get to that. But this one I did get sent a lot. We have the story about an ancient Roman bust that was purchased for nearly $35. I think it was $34.99 at a Texas thrift store, which is now being repatriated to Germany. It is currently on view at the San Antonio Museum of Art. So if you're in San Antonio have a look before it goes back to the Pompagenum in Germany later the year, this year. This was found five years ago at a thrift store, a Goodwill in Austin in Texas. This marble bust is thought to have been created in the first century BCE or perhaps the first century CE. It's Italian or in origin, but the last known record of the piece traces it back to the Pompagenum. It's which is a full scale replica of a Pompeii villa that was commissioned in the 1840s by King Ludwig of Bavaria. This Pompeianum faced heavy bombing during World War II, but it was restored and reopened in the 1960s. But by that time, or perhaps shortly after, this bust had disappeared. Some suggest that it might have been taken by a US soldier who was stationed in that area. This bust, which is currently at the San Antonio Museum of Art, is going to be removed from display on May 21st, at which point it will be moved to Germany. Quote, upon its return, the portrait bust will either go back on display in its original location at the Pompagenum or at the Munich Glyptothek, Glyptothek, with the rest of Ludwig I's collection. It's a great story whose plot includes World War II era, international diplomacy, arts of the Mediterranean, thrift shop sleuthing, another tongue twister, historic Bavarian royalty, and the thoughtful stewardship of those who care for and preserve the arts, whether as individuals or institutions. Emily Bellew Neff called the museum's work with the Bavarian administration of state-owned palaces, quote, a wonderful example of international cooperation. This is another critical way in which our art museums participate in diplomacy around the globe. This is the thing. When we get into conversations about repatriation and international loans and returns and all of the rest of it, these are inter-institutional, but those institutions, whether they are state-funded or not, are representatives of the state. They are involved in diplomacy they are vital to it manda i don't know when your birthday was happy birthday for whenever it was and i hope you had lovely tacos i do love a taco delicious we have this as well, the Jewish heirs of the 
$250 million Gulf treasure have now appealed to a US court for the, uh, about the dismissal of their restitution suit. This is these heirs have formed a consortium, and they are the heirs of a consortium of Jewish art dealers who sold the Gelf treasure to the Prussian state at below market value in 1935 have once again appealed to a US court. This case was originally dismissed in August 2012, apparently due to lack of jurisdiction. The heirs of this consortium told a D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals on Tuesday that the sale had been made under the direction of Nazi leader Hermann Goering. They argued this is therefore not a domestic dispute and that this should be heard in a U.S. court because two of the dealers were, were Dutch nationals at the time, while the others were effectively stateless since Adolf Hitler did not consider Jewish people to be legitimate German nationals. The Gelf treasure in question is made up of 82 medieval era devotional objects, including relics, crosses, altarpieces and precious pieces in gold and silver. And it's thought that it could be worth as much as two hundred and fifty million dollars. The piece that we are seeing here in this photograph, which is just beautiful, it's been labelled as a medallion with the bust of Christ, also known as the Cumberland medallion. It dates to the late 700s, and it's thought that this might originally have served as a brooch. It's one of the earliest objects from the Guelph treasure. Um, so a, a beautiful item that uh, would be, uh, would, one would be very sad to not have in one's possession if, if it were rightfully theirs. We also have a bust of a reliquary and... Also, um, I'm not quite sure what the hand is, but presumably connected to that. The case for the restitution was first brought against the Stefan Prouska Kulturbets, or SPK, which is an organisation that oversees state-run museums in Germany, as I said, in 2008. There was a roadblock hit in 2014 when a German commission argued that the low sale prices could be attributed to the Great Depression. I mean... So it's a reach. But in 2015, the they went to the US saying that the forced transaction violated international law and was an act of genocide. In 2021, the Supreme Court unanimously decided that the suit should not be filed in a US court. And the case was again dismissed by a senior US district judge, Colleen Cola Cotelli in August 2022, because the heirs apparently failed to convince her that their ancestors were foreign nationals at the time of the sale, which would render the transaction a violation of the international domestic takings law, in part because they had not made the same case in previous filings. In the new appeal, the heirs have doubled down on the argument that the dealers were not German nationals. In a brief, the SPK stated, quote, Plaintiffs forfeited these alternative arguments years ago. Regardless of whether their complaints, allegations could support these arguments, litigants must do more than gesture at possible legal theories with value with vague allegations. In court, the SPK's attorney, Jonathan Freeman, argued that the Gelf treasure was technically owned by the dealer's German companies, which were based in Frankfurt. The panel of three judges have not yet indicated when a decision might be announced. So we, I think, will have to wait and see where we end up with that. I think that's, that, is a, that is a great question. That is presumably, that is what this appeal is over, is that the, the US is saying that this is not a US matter and the family are saying that it is a US matter. The argument, I, I am not a lawyer, the argument they seem to be making is that it's a US matter because some of the individuals involved were not citizens of the place in which they claim this forced sale took place. And for that reason, it is a violation of international domestic takings law. So I'm assuming that that is why they're saying, I wonder if they could also potentially try and have it tried elsewhere too. I I do not, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Are the pieces in the US? Nope, not to my knowledge. They are 
this well this one here is at the museum of decorative arts in berlin i'm wondering if they've gone on tour to the us and they're trying to hold them i am i am unsure i and again another great question that i'm i'm wondering if when we get a final ruling on this appeal perhaps we will see what they what the suggestion is that it shouldn't that they're saying that it shouldn't be in the US courts that the US courts don't have jurisdiction the people the plaintiffs involved are saying that they do have jurisdiction that is to my to my understanding they aren't discussing who these items belong to and and who they should be with what they're currently fighting over is whether or not it should be heard in the states or not so we shall see where we where we fall down on that one. My husband just texted me a phrase that I don't know what it means, but I'm going to repeat it. Limited extraterritorial scope of the legislation. So anybody who has a legal understanding who can pass that, hopefully, hopefully that's helpful. This is an excellent article. I'm showing uh, a little bit of it. It's really worth reading the whole thing. This is a, a great in-depth study about from antiquities pillaged during colonial rule to those trafficked by smugglers. India has lost a great deal of its heritage. Now two men are on the case. It starts with a conversation about what crown Camilla was going to wear for the coronation. The question being, would she wear the Queen Mary crown that contains the Kohenor diamond? As it turns out, that is not going to be what's going to happen. We have here, quote, while the palace has not made an official statement about the reason, there were worries about it causing diplomatic issues with India if it had been used, given the country's claims to be its rightful owner. It could also be seen as an appeasement gesture directed towards those who believe the diamond belongs to India given that it originated there, before making its way into British hands and heads when it was surrendered to Queen Victoria following the East India Company's seizure of the Punjab province in 1849. So the picture on the left-hand side of the two pictures, that is the Queen Mary crown featuring the Koh -Anor. We. This is towards the end of the article as I said, it's really worth checking out. Um, these two men who are on the case, we have here how they go about their work. Kumar, who is now based in Chennai, South India, and Saxena, who remains in Singapore, talk with ease about field trips to document missing idols and sting operations with auction houses. So essentially, all of the stuff that we talk about, these guys are at the coalface of, of uh, sorting it out. While information about missing antiquities has always existed, what was lacking was official will to push for their return, they say. Kumar puts things into perspective. Between 1970 and 2012, the Indian government managed to bring back 19 artefacts, while it has restituted 600 in just the last 10 years with their help. Um, pretty pick, absolutely. When it comes to the koh -Anor, surrendered is a very nice way to put it. It, it is a slightly less politic version of what we usually hear which was it was a gift it was a present for queen victoria because they liked her being the empress so much they give her prezi prez <laughs> um yeah wheezy squeeze box it was a gift it was a gift that you definitely i definitely gave you of my own volition while i was a small child and you had my mum in prison yep yeah, cool 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 this is not to suggest they are some kind of gung-ho art vigilante group, although that would be cool, given the amount of plodding through paperwork and complex negotiation work they do. Their work involves advocacy, activism and coordinating between governments and law enforcement, such as customs, Europol and homeland security within India and outside. It's, inc it's an incredible amount of graft to do this stuff to do this work. It is just utterly breathtaking to me, all of the people who tirelessly pursue this, because while I was, I kind of was a bit flippant about a, an art vigilante group, 
of course, we don't want that. We don't want people creating diplomatic incidents. We don't want things being stolen by people who have no intention of restituting them on the claim that they are going to. We want this to be done properly, legally and all above board. That's that's what we want to happen. Kumar says, quote, in the past when they reached out to India, nobody replied. So now we're doing that job. India Pride Project, which is what they're working on, is more of a network than an organisation. We have no money, no employees and no authority, admits Saxena candidly, even a tad proudly. It's an entirely voluntary team and they monitor and flag suspicious objects and they follow paper trails. They make personal visits to auction houses, art galleries and museums, and then they liaise with official agencies to make a case for repatriation. So in short, a very interesting article and a very interesting team to keep an eye on because they certainly seem to be doing a brilliant job and, and they are volunteering. We have another repatriation. We have quite a few still to go, in fact. Dusseldorf settles with a Jewish dealer's heirs on a portrait that hung in the mayor's office. This is the portrait in question. It's entitled The Artist Children, and it's by Wilhelm von Schachtau. Uh, it was once owned by Max Stern, who fled from Nazi persecution in the 1930s. Now the city of Dusseldorf has reached a settlement on this portrait and has thus ended a long running dispute with Max Stern's heirs. Under the terms of settlement, which was approved the day before this article was published, Dusseldorf has brought the painting back from Stern's heirs for an undisclosed sum. So the settlement is, we will pay you so we can keep this. Quote, I'm glad with this fair and just solution, this important painting remains in Dusseldorf. Max Stern took over Gallery Stern on Dusseldorf's Konzing, Konzing Alley after the death of his father in 1934. He was ordered by the Nazis to liquidate the gallery in 1935, but kept it running till 1937 when he was forced to close and auction his stock in Cologne. He fled Germany and then went to where he went to Montreal. He built an art business there that was thriving and he also owned the Dominion Gallery. He died without children in 1987 and his will bequeathed his estate to Concordia and McGill in Montreal, the universities, and the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So in 2002, his estate launched an initiative to recover his lost art, which is called the Max Stern Restitution Project. We hear that a new city council who had been elected in 2020 took a different view and agreed to restitute this painting despite these gaps in provenance. The portrait was probably in the gallery's ownership in 1931 when it was loaned to an exhibition. In 1937, Gallery Stern gave permission for it to be reproduced in a book about the paintings of children and provided the photograph. What can't be proven with certainty is that the gallery owned it at that stage. The city of Dusseldorf acquired it from a private owner in 1959 and it there stayed at the mayor's office. Quote, we couldn't prove that it was not a restitution case. So we as the city, we as the city government recommended to the assembly that it should be restituted. The big parties in the city council supported restitution. Something is apparently wrong with the comment section, not being allowed to send some comments. I have not... I can see this comment. I can't see any blocked comments. Not that I will always will. I haven't set my settings any higher than usual. So if something's happening, it's a YouTube glitch rather than a, a thing that I've I've chosen to happen. Madeline Vanderbunny, thank you very much for the super sticker. That is very kind of you. Thank you ever so much. People are trying to do a fix for the comments. I I'm not sure what's going on. And as I can't see the comments that were blocked, I don't, I don't know what to say. 
uh, people are suggesting to refresh. I can see that. I can see that comment. So I don't I don't know what to say, friends. Fingers crossed. I shall carry on. Sotheby's are offering four newly restituted Impressionist works by Renoir, Gauguin and Cézanne at its what it's calling its Marquis May auctions. I don't know why they're called Marquis May. Um, sounds like a rapper, though, Marquis May. These works, which were all returned to the heirs of the legendary dealer Ambrose Vollard, are expected to fetch more than $17 million. This is the result of years of legal tussles. This is these are going on sale at Sotheby's next month. These four works are including the two paintings by Renoir uh, and Suzanne's undergrowth and Gauguin's still life with mandolin are due to be ordered or offered for sale on May the 16th. It's thought that they're going to fetch between $11.5 million all the way up to $17.35 million. They were shown at Sotheby's in Paris last week. The they're calling the leader of the group. So I suppose this is the highlight of the auction that they're going to think is going to sell the most is the Gauguin. They Sotheby's referred to it as one of his most significant still lifes and is estimated alone as being worth between 10 million to 15 million dollars so that's interesting that that makes up so much of the group this the individual who this collection belonged to volard was instrumental in building the reputation of the most significant artists of the time including picasso cezanne matisse gauguin van gogh and others he staged solo shows for many of these artists but also supported them through their career uh volard left behind some 6000 artworks when he died in a car crash in 1939 the following year the nazis invaded france his brother, Lucien Villard, along with two French art experts, allegedly stole numerous paintings from the dealer's inheritance. Some art of the artworks were sold to family members of the Nazi party. Others were offered to German museums and to dealers. It's Mercury in retrograde at work took Shannon I've just seen this comment come up twice that it took you three times to send the comment that you just read I've just seen that come up twice so I don't know if you meant to post that twice but it did appear twice maybe Mercury is in retrograde apologies I'm very sorry if it's I'm not doing it though here are the other works we have going on in 2013, the Vullard heirs filed to have a total of seven artworks returned, including these four paintings that are being sold next month. The French state declined the request, claiming there was not sufficient proof the pieces were stolen. Eventually, though, the case makes its way through the French court system, and then in May 2022, a judge ruled that the four artworks were the property of Vullard when he died and therefore should belong to his heirs. The ruling was then upheld in a French high court last November. So we shall see what the heirs get for as, for, as a from this auction. And when we have that, I will, of course, update you. Our last repatriation slash decolonization news comes to us from Peru and L.A., the United States on Friday returned several Peruvian antiquities, including intricate knotwork artefacts known as quipus, at a ceremony at the Los Angeles consulate. I believe these are thought to be essentially ways of recording events. The brief event, so the this repatriation ceremony came amid a push in recent years to have museums, universities and governments worldwide return cultural pieces to their home countries and tribal nations, something that we have been talking about. These items returns to the Peruvian Consul General, including included two quipus. These are intricately knotted and coloured sets of cords that experts believe were used by the Incas to count and to keep records. 
These repatriated keepers were turned over to federal investigation investigators two years ago by a private art gallery. They may have been donated to the gallery or abandoned there. Okay, sometime between 2005 and 2012. At the same time, also repatriated were several sculptures that LA-based agents from the US Department of Homeland Security had seized in a since-closed investigation dating back 15 years. Last year, the FBI repatriated several Peruvian artefacts that had been voluntarily surrendered to federal agents. They included historical documents and a 17th century painting that had been stolen from a Peruvian church in 92. They also included a painting stolen from a different church in 2002 that was hand carried into the United States by an art dealer. In 2021, the San Francisco Asian Art Museum returned two hand carved religious artifacts, sandstone lintels dating back to the 9th and 10th centuries to the Thai government. These antiquities have been stolen and exported from Thailand, which is a violation of Thai law, about 50 years ago, and then donated to the city of San Francisco, which owns the art museum. So some interesting repatriations happening there. That's a very good question. Do we know if they have been translated? I don't believe beyond the idea that they are used as a record of time passing of items. That is my understanding. If that is incorrect, please, somebody, if you can, whack it in a comment and I will share that. But my understanding is they that they understand their manufacture, but not in every case their full meaning. Perhaps. We are moving on to the new news, and we have this um, concerning effect of climate change. Stat sand storms driven by climate change, we are told, are slowly burying Iraq's ancient treasures. Iraqi archaeological marvels that have survived for millennia and, ha and have also survived the ravages of war are being blasted and slowly buried by sandstorms linked to climate change. These are ancient Babylonian treasures that were painstakingly unearthed are now disappearing once again. Under a wind-blown sand in a land parched by rising heat and prolonged droughts. Whoever wrote that sentence, that is a delightful sentence about an upsetting thing. We are told that Iraq is one of the countries that's been worst hit by climate change, that it's endured a dozen sandstorms in the last year that turned the sky orange and that brought daily life to a halt, leaving people gasping for air. When these storms clear, there's fine sand all over everything, including the Sumerian ruins of Umm al-Aqarib, which is also known as the Mother of Scorpions, in the southern desert province of Dikar. Sandstorms have begun to reverse work that's been that's been done to unearth the temples. Archaeologists, we're told, in Iraq have always had to shovel sand, but now the volume is growing. After a decade of worsening storms, sand now covers a good part of the site, which dates back to 2350 BCE and spans more than five square kilometres. We have been told that the, in the past, the biggest threat was the looting of antiquities at these this, these ruins, where pottery fragments and clay tablets bearing ancient cuneiform script have been discovered. But now it's the changing weather and its impact on the land, especially what they're calling creeping desert, desertification, desertification, it's spelled an additional threat to these ancient sites. In the next quote, in the next 10 years, it is estimated that sand could have covered 80 to 90 percent of these archaeological sites. Now, what I am going to point out is that all too often when we want to preserve something, we bury it back up. But this isn't and, and it can be safe if you bury it back underground. But there is a problem with this in that. This problem is compounded by salinization. Because of the extreme heat, water lands on the surface and then evaporates, and it does so so quickly that the soil doesn't absorb the crystals, which are then left behind as a crust. It's hyper dry. The water evaporates and leaves a salt residue that you can see on the bricks at these really important sites. 
then the salt in the earth that's carried by the sandstorms causes a chemical weathering for these archaeological buildings. Iraqi authorities insist they are tackling the complex and multi-layered problems. It's working to contain the sand dunes. There's a plan to plant a that's doorbell, apologies. There's a plan to plant a green belt of trees that will apparently cost about $3.8 million. There are doubts, though, that in trying to keep this vegetation alive, quote, you're going to need a lot of water. When it comes to climate change, he said, quote, we are a country facing the most and acting the least. We are at the bottom of the list in terms of acting against climate change. So, it's not just a case of it being reburied. In reburying it, it's also causing erosion because of the of the weather concerns and, and the salt. Moving on to the new news. This was very interesting to me. Archaeologists uncover the first human representations of the ancient Tartessos people. And what was interesting is, I, uh, Yvonne, I don't need to go and get the door because my husband is there. And what's happened is our Tesco delivery... <laughs> has arrived that's what that is so we i'm going i can have sandwiches during the week that's what that is that's what's come there <laughs> welcome this is when i when i have the chance to record and this stuff happens i can edit it out but uh, as it currently stands they do love a loud doorbell ring <laughs> maybe do you know what maybe marianne it's not in fact tesco's maybe maybe the king himself has has popped round on his little bicycle, I assume he he rides a bicycle. He's very green. Maybe he's come round and he's uh, hand delivering my invite. Well, I'm I'm free <laughs> on that day, so you can let me know. <laughs> Does it include tartar sauce? Almost certainly. I blimmin' love tartar sauce from fish and chips on Friday. I cannot deal without it. Anyway. This is what I found interesting is I I admit my ignorance when it appears and it frequently does. And I had never heard of the tartar sauce people. So I Googled it. And the first thing that came up was the Wikipedia entry, which I know we shouldn't necessarily go use it as a source. But the Wikipedia entry referred to this civilization as being semi mythological or semi mythical. And I'm like. Well, it's they've made the faces. So, what does that what does that even mean? I am um, I am befuddled by that. But I thought I'd share it because that was that was interesting to me. In this article, we hear that this culture emerges during the late Bronze Age, so perhaps not semi mythical, <laughs> as it seems to be a culture here in the southwest Iberian Peninsula of Spain. It is characterised as having a mix of Paleo Hispanic and Phoenician traits, speaking a now extinct language called Tartessian. Tartessian? They were skilled, these people were skilled in metal, metallology. Mm, that's how I'm going to say that word because I don't, I can't get it out of my mouth any other way. And metalworking, creating ornate objects and decorative jugs. They, the characteristic includes pear-shaped jugs, shallow dish-shaped braziers with loop handles, incense burners with floral motifs, fibulas, and belt buckles. It's thought that this community worshipped the goddess Ars, 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 Astart or Petonia, that's what we're going to go with, and or Baal or Melkar. A press release issued by the Higher Council for Scientific Research or the CSIC announced the discovery of figured reliefs depicting human representations. These reliefs date from around the 5th century BC and were discovered in the remains of the sanctuary that were used for the ritual sacrifice of animals. This sanctuary was discovered back in 2017 when archaeologists from the Archaeology Institute of Merida uncovered, I thought I was going to say Madeira there, but it's Merida, uncovered the remains of 16 horses, two bulls and a pig. The reliefs that we are seeing here appear to be female figures, which the researchers suggest could be representations of the Tarsasian pantheon of gods. Three other reliefs are fragmented in a poor state of preservation, but one of them has been identified as a Tartasian warrior. 
A spokesman from the CSIC said, quote, this extraordinary finding represents a profound paradigm shift in the interpretation of the Tartessos people, who are traditionally considered an aniconic culture for representing divinity, divinity through animal or plant motifs rather than people, or through Betilios, sacred stones. So we have these new things that are changing the, the way that they are understanding it. Isn't it fascinating? <laughs> now you have written that, I cannot unsee it. Those I think, those I think are earrings, but the I think it's the way the, the crack has happened. That does that does look familiar. Let's do an out of context question. Why not? I'm feeling. What's it like being a mother? Fun, I think. Tiring, um, challenging, eh, confronting. You all of those all of those things it's both it's the best thing i've ever done and also the hardest because it certainly feels like it is the thing that matters the most because if you get it wrong that's a big deal that's a, a huge the big boo boo if you get it wrong so that's how it feels but it also it makes you assess all sorts of things that you thought about your life um it's like therapy, but no one's guiding you. <laughs> it's what I will say. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. It is it is both it is the best of times and it is the worst of times. But even in the worst of times, you wouldn't you wouldn't change it. This is interesting. Chicken breeding in Japan, we are told, dates back to the 4th century BCE. I'm not going to read that out loud. Um, my husband accused my son of gaslighting him the other day. <laughs> it was over an episode of the Teletubbies. We started seeing if we can um, get my son to um, watch a bit of his tablet and then give it back. We're trying to kind of... you bring screens in in a way that he he is limited with them and he understands those limits but he was watching an episode of the Teletubbies and you know how for those of you who've seen Teletubbies and it's been on for eternity so I'm sure you have they there's the baby in the sun that is borderline creepy it's watching you from above it's a bit frightening so my husband said to my son oh look at the creepy little baby and <laughs> my son went it's not a baby it's a son. And it just been in mean, that point of the weekend where my husband's response was, are you gaslighting me? And I'm like, no, because he's two and a half and he doesn't know what gaslighting is. <laughs> but clearly he recognised that it upset my husband because from that point on, whenever my husband pointed out the baby, <laughs> my son would look at his father and look at him like he was loop-de-loop -loop and go, it's a son. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's what's, that's what's going on in our house. My, my son is doing a psyops of my husband. Um, so we have chicken breeding dating back to the 4th century BCE. And this is conclusive evidence of chicken breeding. We are told the chicken is one of the most common domesticated animals, with current estimated population being over 33 billion individuals. Brian, that's an excellent. Pretty sure the sun is lit by gas. Brava, brava for that pun. Brava. Um, I don't know if the Teletubbies are are producing new episodes. I, I, I'm gonna be honest. I'm not a connoisseur. <laughs> of what series we're on all i know is uh my son sits in the bath and makes tubby custard which is just him playing with water but he tells me it's tubby custard he loves it 
The chicken is believed to have been domesticated in Southeast Asia about 3,500 years ago. The exact date of chicken breeding into Japan is under debate as there are no historical records and the evidence, the archaeological evidence, is inconclusive. <laughs> what a foul topic. Lol. <laughs> Excellent. Um, daughter and sister, her teddy bear was a kitty, finally called it Kitty Bear. My son has a Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. For some reason, that's called Cheddar. I don't know. It's, but it's called Cheddar. At a certain point, that's the thing that motherhood teaches you, I think parenthood, is fight fight the battles you really need to fight. <laughs> Everything else. You have to ask yourself, does this really matter? Does this really matter to me, to us? Is this something that I could just get on with? This so to find out about this chicken breeding, the team used a technique a technique called zoo archaeology by mass spectrometry spectrometry shortened to zoo ms. They analyzed the collagen once again. Collagen coming up as a big thing in these new historical exploration technologies and techniques. They analyzed the collagen in two of the juvenile sets of bones. I can't pronounce that word. This previous work done had shown that domestic chicken and Japanese wild pheasants had different zoo MS fingerprints. Zoo MS revealed that the two, both of the two bones belonged to chickens. The collagen from one of the bones was then carbon dated to 381 to 204 BCE. Quote, 10 of the 11 previously discovered bones of adult chicken from the period have all belonged to males. Hence, it was thought chicken breeding could not have occurred on the Japanese archipelago. By identifying bones from juvenile chickens, we provide clear evidence that breeding did occur in that time period, which was also the earliest times chickens could have been introduced into Japan. In addition, Karakokaji is considered an important trade hub of the Yayo, Yayoi period. So there's a possibility that this status is a factor in chicken breeding during the period. The archaeological discoveries of chickens in Japan show that the human-chicken relationship was different from that revealed by archaeological studies in China and Europe. There is going to be future research that will focus on understanding these differences. So I am wondering why they haven't found any lady chickens because that would be necessitating something that's necessary for breeding but presumably if they have younglings they have ladies so then the question becomes are there no lady chicken bones being found because they were like boiled or ground were they in, were they made was it lady chicken bones that were made in some kind of bone meal or something Maybe. Interesting. Scientists at the British Museum in London have used cutting edge technology to see inside six ancient Egyptian animal coffins that have remained sealed for over two millennia. There is a study that's been published in the journal Nature Scientific Reports. It was published in on April the 20th, and it provides insights into the religious rituals and mummification practices that took place in ancient Egypt. We are told it's rare that these metal coffins survive intact. There are six coffins in this study. All have been dated to somewhere between 664 and 250 BCE. All are sealed, each topped with a figurine representing either a lizard or a human eel cobra hybrid, which sounds as disturbing as I'm sure it is. Our aim, quote, our aim when carrying out our research into the British Museum collection is to be minimally invasive. It was not an option for us to physically open the coffins, which would have damaged the coffins themselves, as well as potentially destroying their contents. Usually, the non-invasive imaging can be done using the same techniques doctors use, so an X-ray. But the X-rays were unable to get through the thick metal walls, so the team had to come up with another solution. Neutrons have properties which allow them to pass through some metals more easily than X-rays. They are effective at seeing organic materials, so they fire neutrons into these sealed coffins and measure the extent 
to which they were scattered and absorbed. And this then allows researchers to be able to see inside. Quote, we hope to extend this study to more sealed metal coffins and containers in the British Museum collection now that we have seen the effectiveness of neutron imaging for revealing hidden content and understanding ancient manufacturing practices. This technique could also be applied to other metal objects, for example, statues, to understand how they were made and to expand our knowledge of ancient metalworking technology, which I think would be really cool. That would be really cool to know how, particularly like metal statues, how they were made. That would be very interesting. And also, what if there's stuff inside? Like a, like a kinder surprise. Interesting. Maybe. Stranger things have happened. Maybe that is the that is the news update that we'll get. Is that the British Museum just starts to give things back? We're back on the back to the chickens. It does seem odd to assume that no breeding happened just because you have no female data to work with. Clearly, females existed. I wondered about this, and my thought was: so, what are the what are the male chickens doing there? The roosters. Why would they be there? What would be the purpose? Are they just being kept as as pets? I don't know. I don't know. What is my personal superpower? Well, it's the capacity to make anything into a smutty joke. <laughs> it's a gift. I'd like to give it back, but no one's um, taking exchanges. Oh, there's a big jump. <laughs> Which now we're not. Do you know what, Justine? We're not getting into that. <laughs> I'm not getting. I'm not getting into that. Who keeps chickens as pets? I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of kind of well toffs who have hobby farms and like maybe they maybe their chicken lays an egg but they 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 don't really care if it's a rooster or a chicken they like the thing of having chickens i think people do keep them as pets i i don't know i don't know you'd never let me give that power back well no one's taking it <laughs> So I'm stuck like this, constantly having to bite my lip before I say something that will lose me a job. <laughs> right. Oh, chickens are smelly that you grew up on a farm. Well. Ah, a vet in the house. Oh, if you're going to be a pet, people keep saying snakes are cool. Snakes are cool. Oh, hang on. This is jumping so fast. We had um, Sarah saying that she's a, a vet and people do keep chickens as pets. People keep all sorts of, people all keep all sorts of weird things as pets. <laughs> Your mum sounds excellent, Amanda. My mum had a pet rooster for a while. His name was Snowflake and he lived in the house. <laughs> Snowflake sounds amazing. <laughs> oh. Right. <laughs> so, ancient DNA reveals the secret of the empire that pushed China to build its Great Wall. We are told a nomadic empire dominated the Asian steppe for three centuries from 200 BC, trading goods on the Silk Road road rolled <laughs> trading goods on the silk road building elaborate tombs for its dead and conquering distant lands on horseback known as the zongnu this empire saw conflict with the great rival imperial china that resulted in the construction of the great wall parts of which still stand today there are no records written records save for those produced by chinese chroniclers who regarded the Zonggu as barbarians. So the empire and its people have long remained in the shadows of history, but now we've got DNA evidence. And this is because of the fruits of recent archaeological digs. 
an international team of scientists have completed a genetic investigation of the two cemeteries along the western frontier of this empire in what is now Mongolia. It's an aristocratic elite cemetery at Takilitan Kogto, I apologise for that, and a local elite cemetery as Shombuzon Belchir. The scientists sequenced the genomes of 17 individuals in the two cemeteries and they found an, quote, extremely high level of genetic diversity, making it likely that this empire was multi-ethnic, multicultural and multilingual. And this is according to a new study that was published on the Friday before this article came out in a journal called Science Advances. This diversity was found within individual communities, suggesting that the empire wasn't just a patchwork of homogenous groups united by a common cause. Ursula Broseda, prehistorical archaeologist at the University of Bonn, said the research provided deeper insight into the social fabric of the society of the Zhongnu, using genetics as a tool. Quote, I'm excited to see more studies of this kind in the future. Since I was one of the people who pointed out that mature women were buried with the most prestigious that mature women were buried with the most prestigious items, I am exi- excited to see that genetics corroborates this view. Brusader Brusader added that the Zhongzhu had often been misunderstood because most of the information about the regime and others that originated on the Eurasian steppes comes from texts from Imperial China and ancient Greece, where the largely nomadic herders were viewed as inferior. An ancient necropolis from 2,000 years ago has been unearthed next to a Paris train station. The There are no pictures in this because it did show human remains and we don't show that on this channel. Just meters from a busy uh, rail station in the heart of Paris, scientists have uncovered 50 graves in an ancient necropolis, which offers a rare glimpse of the life of the French capital's precursor, Lutetia, nearly 2,000 years ago. This necropolis was stumbled upon during multiple roadworks over the years, including the Port Royal station on the historic left bank in the 1970s. Plans for a new exit for the train station prompted an archaeological investigation. This is called the Saint-Jacques Necropolis, the largest burial site in the Gallo-Roman town of Lutetia, previously excavated in the 1800s. At that time, only objects considered precious were taken from the graves, with many of the skeletons, burial offerings and other artefacts abandoned. This necropolis was then covered over and lost time. We are told that one section had never before been excavated, that it had not been seen since antiquity. The team, we are told, was very happy to have found a skeleton with a coin in its mouth, allowing them to date this burial to the 2nd century AD. The excavation that had begun in March has uncovered 50 graves, all of which were used for burial and not cremation, which was apparently common at the time. They found the remains of men, women and children. They were buried in wooden coffins, which are now only identifiable by their nails. They were buried alongside grave offerings like ceramic jugs and goblets. Sometimes a coin was placed in a coffin or even in the mouth of the dead, which was a common practice at the time called Sharon's Obel. It, we've talked about this before, that Sharon is the ferryman of Hades that takes souls across the river Styx. Archaeologists found shoes inside graves, identifying them by the small nails that would have been in the sole. These shoes were placed either at the feet of the dead or next to them like an offering. There was jewellery, hairpins and belt also discovered. The entire skeleton of a pig and another small animal was discovered in a pit where animals were thought to have been sacrificed by the gods. And unlike the excavations in the 1800s, this time the team managed plans to remove everything from the necropolis for analysis, which will allow them to understand the life of the Parisi through their funeral rites, as well as their health by studying their DNA. We are told that the ancient history of Paris is was generally, quote, not well known. And this these unearthed graves open, quote, a window into the world of Paris during antiquity. So we shall see, I'm sure, when we uh, when we get some more evidence coming out of these studies. 
A Roman fortlet that was lost for hundreds of years has been found near a Scottish primary school. Archaeologists have found the buried remains of a Roman fortlet that once stood next to the Anatine Wall. It was thought to be lost to the mists of time. This newly discovered fortlet is part of several such structures along the Anatine Wall. Anat Nine Wall. It would have been occupied by 10 to 12 Roman soldiers who were stationed at a Roman fort nearby. They would man this fort for a week at a time before being replaced by another detachment. Reference was made to this fort lit in 1707. Rona, Riona McMorrow, a deputy head of World Heritage at HES, said, quote, It's great to see how our knowledge of history is growing as new methods give us fresh insights into the past. Archaeology is often partly detective work and the discovery at Khalif is a nice example of how observation made 300 years ago and new technology can come together to add to our understanding. This discovery came on World Heritage Day and the Anatine Wall is one of Scotland's six UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Professor David Breeze, the former Chief Inspector of Ancient Monuments for HES, said the fort lid would have been part of a wider network designed to, dis- to control the indigenous tribal populations. He said the Anatine Wall was one of the was the most sophisticated frontier of the Roman Empire. And in spite of over a hundred years of excavation, it still has many secrets to reveal. We believe there are many more of these to discover, and finding these will help us understand the original plan for the frontier. Very interesting. So I'm sure we will get some new information as more digs take place. We have got fragments of a large wall painting found in Cartagena's uh, Roman theatre. This uh, Cartagena is a was founded as a Carthaginian city in 228 BC in southeastern Iberia in Spain. It was a new city and served as a staging point for the Carth- Carthaginian incursions into Spain. Between five and 1 BC, the Romans constructed a large monumental theatre that could hold up to 7,000 spectators for public performances and ceremonies. This theatre was discovered in 1988. Then after that, there was a long-term project of restoration and reconstruction, and then the theatre was turned into an open-air museum. There have been since recent excavations that have discovered over 2,000 fragments from a large mural painting that would have decorated the walls of the portico with a double portico gallery revolving around a central room housing a garden at the back of the stage in the western section of the theatre complex. This discovery adds to 1,500 fragments previously uncovered in 2006, which is allowing the research to continue the process of restoring the painting in its original design with more accuracy. This restoration is in its early stages, and depiction of ornate Roman figures are beginning to emerge, in addition to linear artistic features. Excavations are planned to explore the central garden, where the researchers hope to find evidence of flower beds, piping that fed to water fountains, as well as to understand how water was used to maintain the flora in the open space. A Roman temple, we're well, saying with Roman, has been found in France that they think might have been dedicated to the war god Mars. This has been found in northwest France and it's thought to date to the first century BC. It's a temple or sanctuary, part of a Roman complex that spread over more than 17 acres or seven hectares. And it was discovered last year. And it's thought that it was probably visited by Roman soldiers who were posted to the region. Quote, the size of the sanctuary indicates that it was an important place for religion. Le Bon Jean's role is to quickly preserve and study artefacts that are unearthed during the excavations, which might otherwise deteriorate quickly when exposed to air or light. 
X-rays and computerized 3D imaging are being used to document the discoveries. Eric Nord, an archaeology an archaeologist with the Dutch Archaeological Agency RAAP, who is excavating a sanctuary used by Roman soldiers in the Netherlands, said he's cautious about assigning the sanctuary at La Chapelle de Fougueres to Mars alone. And that's because the sanctuary that he's working on shows that Roman temples were often associated with several deities. Quote, when you look only at the sculptures and the weapons and the military equipment, one would conclude that Hercules is venerated. But careful research shows instead that several different gods were worshipped there. It's quite dangerous to assign a deity to a sanctuary based only on the finds, not inscriptions or texts, he said. A 2,000-year-old Roman winery has been found. This is, is revealing new insights into the cultural importance of agriculture in ancient Rome and its role as a form of entertainment for the highest echelons of society. This was found at the lavishly decorated villa of the Quintili, where the day-to-day -day production of wine was presented as entertainment for wealthy, powerful Romans and may even have been the emperor himself. Excavations and a study upon them, which has been published in the journal Antiquity, has shown there was a complex system of rooms and channels used for wine production and storage. The winemaking process would have begun in the treading room, which, unlike other waterproof plaster cover examples from the same period, was found to be clad in expensive red marble. The slippery nature of marble makes it an unusual choice for a production area and further hints at the importance of the theatricality of the wine. These excavations began in 2017 and it revealed mechanisms like two large presses and a multicoloured marble-clad fountain-like system through which wine flows to storage jars in the cellar. So they are just watching wine be made i think which is interesting we are told there's a series of lavishly decorated rooms surrounding the winery which may have been used by the emperor and his retinue to dine while observing the wine being made i suppose though so is this like the belly hana of wine but Wine needs to ferment, so you can't drink the stuff you're watching be made. This is interesting. Each of these rooms have wide open entrances. Hello. Um, wide open entrances offer an expensive view of the workers and the mechanisms of the winery system. We are told, quote, it would have been a real spectacle for those watching. The combination of the fountains of wine and water, luxurious materials, especially the thin white marble channel through which the wine could be seen flowing. And the sounds of the workers and music would have resulted in a theatrical show. The villa of the Quintili was part of the imperial estate. And both its proximity to Rome and luxurious decorations suggest that it may have played an active role in imperial life. Compared to other imperial properties where once lavish quarters were later transformed for utilitarian use, Gordian's imperial court may have visited the villa of the Quintili for a ritual at this facility associated with the annual vintage. This winery's discovery has also increased our knowledge of the brief reign of Gordian III, who we now know began a programme of monumental construction focused on infrastructure and restoration of facilities for spectacle, including Rome's famous Colosseum. Well, when you put it like that, Wheezy Squeeze Box, we've got ourselves a show, haven't we? We've got ourselves a show. Um, Justine, I have been to a winery and it was it was fascinating and, and seeing and seeing how it was made, I I don't think I would necessarily need, um, for my own purposes, this level of extra detail of, of fountains flowing and, and and watching people stamping on wine. But, you know, hey, it's what, whatever, whatever floats your boat. 
I'm going to be honest, I'm not, I've read this article and I'm not 100% sure what this picture shows, but it's the one that came with the article. We are told that archaeologists have discovered a Roman sanctuary and cemetery in Belgium. The team were conducting a soil investigation of a now demolished cycling track in the Van Innes Sports Park. This place was first settled by the Romans during the first century AD as a vicus or rural settlement. It was situated on the junction of the Diverticulum Road, connecting the eastern city of Tonagaren with the western city of Boulogne. 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 Um, the vicus was destroyed, destroyed during, the, during the end of the third century AD by Germanic tribes. Archaeologist Killian Viverhart led the excavations, which uncovered traces of burial grounds, circular ditches, and a settlement dating from the Iron Age. The team has also found a Roman cemetery with up to 30 burials and evidence of an open air sanctuary for worshipping the Roman pantheon of gods. According to the researchers, the cemetery contains cremation burials, where, according to tradition, the deceased was placed on a cremation pyre and the ashes would then be deposited into urns and buried. Oh, maybe this is smaller. Maybe this, maybe what we're seeing is smaller. Is this the top of an urn? I thought that it might have been like a futuristic building. I thought that this was an aerial shot, but now I've just thought about it. Yeah, it's a cremation urn, isn't it? <laughs> I was like, how is that a Roman sanctuary? I thought that that what we were seeing the Roman sanctuary, and I was trying to figure out where the entry was. I need to, I need to sleep more. <laughs> Uh, Killian said, quote, nearby we found some jars, shards of glass and a cloak pin. There is also a Roman or Carolingian well, which will drain, we will drain for further research. There's much more than the preliminary investigation suggested. I am pleased that it wasn't just me. Les, you, you're you now seeing. I thought it was, do you know what I, do you know what I saw when I saw this? What is that old cartoon where they all got in a car? It was, and they had um, the Jetsons. I saw the Jetsons house, and that's what I thought it was. Justine, it's definitely not too much wine because I don't drink alcohol. So um, it's just sleep deprivation on account of my child thinking that sleep is for the week. So yeah, I, I saw this and thought that it was the Jetsons house. So I thought this was the sanctuary. But cremation urn <laughs> makes a lot more sense. <laughs> what wild! My my brain is a noisy place. We we're staying with Rome. We we're never leaving. It's, or a submarine hatch. Why not? Why not? A two thousand year old hoard of Roman coins is thought to have been hidden during a, a bloody civil war by a soldier. 175 silver coins have been found in a forest in Italy, and these coins seem to date from 82 BC, which is the year that the Roman general Lucius Cornelius Sulla fought a bloody war across Italy against his enemies, including the leaders of the Roman Republic. As it was, Sulla was victorious, and he ascended as a dictator of the Roman state. This coin hoard is the equivalent of tens of thousands of dollars in today's money and it's thought that it might have been buried by a soldier who was then killed in battle. This was found in a terracotta pot in 2021 but the site was then kept secret so it could be completely investigated. The coins were discovered by a member of an archaeological group in a newly cut area of forest northeast of the city of Livorno in Tuscany. The earliest coins are said to date from 157 or 156 BC, with the latest being from 83 or 82 BC. And of course, people do keep coins around for a while. The area was then forested. These coins have definitely been hidden, we're told. They, they constituted a treasure or piggy bank. 
The easiest way to hide valuables is to bury them underground, away from homes where no one could find them. This is presumably buried, they think, during a troubled period in Italian history. A few years earlier, Italy had been gripped by the social war between Rome and its Italian allies. While in 82 BC, Sulla had just returned with his legions from Asia to confront his enemies in Rome. We are told, quote, it's a very turbulent historical period. Sulla's soldiers conquered territories as they advanced from south to north, but central Italy and Tuscany had not yet been conquered. The victory was followed about 30 years later by a much larger Roman civil war between Julius Caesar and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, or Pompey the Great, who rose to power as a deputy to Sulla. And then Caesar's victory in that war led directly to the rise of power of Augustus, the first Roman emperor. It became abundantly clear to everyone that whoever came out as the winner of the civil war would be, maybe not by law, but certainly in reality, the master of Rome. So uncertain times indeed. Um, so I don't, I can't speak to Rome and, and the, the monetary system in that. So I'm by no means an expert. What I do know is that when it came to, for example, the early modern period, there are, there are banks in Europe, but for the majority of people, they, they wear their wealth. They might carry some coins here or there if they need to translate stuff into money. Very, very wealthy people who have jeweled clothing would either sell that clothing to liquidate it down into cash to buy what they want to buy, or they potentially pawn it to then buy it back later. So there is money to be lent by money lenders, but I wouldn't necessarily call think that I wouldn't think the average person is keeping their money in banks. And I'm not quite sure where that begins. So I Ah, Carve feeling the temples were used as banks in the same in the same I have to look into this sort of stuff. So in this in the same way that we would understand a bank, because it does become quite different in the early modern period. That's entirely possible. Again, this I'm I I'm not sure about that. That's entirely possible. I all I know is that for your average person in early modern England, which of course is a, in many cases, the post-Reformation England, money comes in and out of mints. There are people who are lending money. There are some kind of pawn brokerage. There are things, theatre companies will sometimes buy in elite clothing or give money for elite clothing that as part of it, as part of the interest maybe, because you can't really charge interest, the actors are allowed to wear it all of that sort, sort of stuff. Ah, uh, thank you for explaining that, Carve Felum. So the Romans didn't have a system of money transfer, but you could leave your money in temples for safekeeping. The Medici absolutely were, they were bankers and they, and they were definitely lending to, they were lending to kings and princes, but for your average soldier, they aren't dealing with the Medicis, to my knowledge happy to be happy to be corrected yeah the medicis were absolutely a well-known banking family but i don't think i don't think the banking my understanding is that banking was not as ubiquitous across society as it would be in in current times today and that's the other thing yes that's another point the money lenders and money exchanges were independent so it's not it's not a unified system. So you've got on the one hand money lenders, pawnbrokers, bankers. It's it's not the it's not the system that we would understand it to be today. Uh, but that is perhaps the topic for a video where I can go into more depth. Many noble Romans were into money lending through intermediaries. Being able to charge uh, charge interest is a great way to profit. 
We're going to hop off of money lending and we're going to stay, but we are staying with Rome. Is YouTube glitching? I apologise. Is that Does that mean you can't see me? Are the visuals but problematic? I hope not. I hope you can see and hear me. Devi, thank you for this comment. Julius Caesar initiated the practice of allowing bankers to confiscate land in lieu of loan payment. This is a monumental shift of power in the relationship of creditor and debtor. Thank you very much for that information. I was absolutely not aware. Thank you for letting me know and letting us all know. Lovely. We've got a quote here. Wealthy people in Rome stored their coins and jewels in the basements of temples. They were seen to be secure given the presence of priests and temple work um, temple workers, not to mention armed guards. Oh, Carve Feel of it's swallowing what you're typing. I uh, yeah, the chat function is weird. I maybe Mercury is in retrograde. If that does something to I don't know what that means, but I've heard people say it. So I'm gonna go with that. Well, I mean, of course, we used to put things, valuable things in in the bottom of churches and cathedrals and abbeys. The crown jewels used to be housed at Westminster Abbey, which makes loads more sense because that is where coronation happened or many coronations were happening. So having it at Westminster makes loads of sense. And the monks are obviously trustworthy until they weren't until the monks were involved in a heist of the crown jewels. Uh, and at that point, the reason why they're at the, at the tower is because the monks robbed them <laughs> on one occasion. We're staying with Romans, and apparently early Romans may have been the first to breed flat-faced dogs. A team of osteoarchaeologists, archaeologists and veterinarian scientists from the Istanbul University and the University of Environmental and Life Sciences has found evidence that early Romans were breeding dogs with flat faces. There's a study that's reported in the Journal of Archaeological Science. The group examined the remains of a dog found in a tomb in a city that was once called Trelis, which is now in modern Turkey. This these dogs' remains were found at a dig site back in 2007, but they were at that time thought to uh, be too delicate for study, so they were put in safe storage instead. In 2021, a, the team on this new effort retrieved these bones and began to study them. The specimen was not complete, but the research team was still able to determine that it was a dog and that it had been treated well. Cute. Many dog remains have been found from Roman times and most were used as work animals and were not well treated. The team identified this dog as a brachycephalic breed, which is, includes flat faced dogs such as boxers, pugs and chow chows. This find, we are told, is unique. Only one other brachycephalic breed has ever been found before in the Roman Empire, and that was in the ruins of Pompeii. The research team was able to deduce the dog's general size and they thought it was smaller than expected. Carbon dating revealed it to be from 1,942 and 2,118 years ago. The study of its teeth showed that it barely made it into adulthood before dying. They compared this skull with several modern dog breeds and found that it probably looked mostly like a French bulldog. We're told this dog would be very close to a human, who they suggest was likely its owner. They think that this might further suggest that the dog was killed and buried when its master died so that the two could be buried together. Is this based on only one skull? I think this study is based on one skull that they're talking about here. I think they have this one skull and that's what this is referring to. This is why didn't Henry want the Abbey left standing? They, few reasons. They had been a site of rebellion against his desired changes. There was concerns about them being loyal to the Pope. There were some in the reforming community that thought that things like monastic life, including its call for celibacy, was superstition. They were not in favour of clerical celibacy. That is something that the reformers uh, bucked against. On top of that, 
they'd already been stripped so that Henry could take all the money. So there wasn't much to support them. And plus, it was a really great way to give land and stuff to your mates so that you could solidify your power in England. So it essentially, nobles were either gifted vast packets of land or they were allowed to buy it. So that was why that was why it kind of worked quite nicely. Uh, I, I think the only possible check or balance that Henry might have had, certainly post-Reformation, uh, would have been if somebody had successfully rebelled. I mean, there's always the chance that somebody could try and pull him down as a tyrant. But apart from that, divine right, absolute monarch. This um, finding, this study has been much reported over the last week or so, usually in a way that frankly buries what's really interesting about it, that it's been lots of press are reporting this as Norse people were in America before Columbus. We know that. <laughs> that is old news. Um but they are presenting it as if it is new news, but it's not. What's interesting is that archaeologists have used wood tax analysis to distinguish wood that has imported driftwood and native wood from five north farmsteads in Greenland, this imported timber into North America. Historical records have long suggested that medieval Norse colonists on Greenland relied on important material such as iron and wood. And until now, it's not been fully recognised where these imports of wood came from. To study timber origins and distribution on Greenland, they examined the wood assemblages from five Norse sites in Western Greenland four of which were medium-sized farms and one a high-status Episcopal manor. These sites were dated between AD 1000 and 1400. They were dated by radiocarbon dating and associated artefact types. The results show that 0.27% of the wood examined were unambiguous imports, including oak, beech, hemlock and jack pine. Another 25% of the total wood studied could either be imported or driftwood. Because hemlock and jack pine were not present in Northern Europe during the early second millennium AD, the pieces identified from these medieval contexts must have come from North America. This confirms the historical sources that the Norse did acquire wood from the east coast of North America. In addition, to the possibility of import, driftwood was one of the important raw materials in North Greenland, making up over 50% of combined assemblage. Wood also came from Europe, likely including oak, beech and Scots pine from this assemblage. Some may have come as ready-made artefacts, such as barrel staves, while reused ship timber could have been bought to use in buildings on Greenland. I think, yes, at some point, but before this, all land was connected is my understanding. But this is a shippy move rather than a walkie move. Wow, that's excellent language use there, Katrina. Well done. <laughs> Staying with Norse finds, we have a woman in Norway who found a 1,000-year-old Viking horde in her basement. We don't have basements like that over here. This was when she was cleaning her parents' home. How old is your parents' home? Yes, the supercontinent, Pangaea. Yes. I Yeah, I had questions about driftwood washing up frequently enough. I suppose... It, I suppose if you find a few sections... And if it's big enough, it can be it can be useful. So we have this. 
Cleaning her parents' home, she discovered dozens of Viking Age artefacts when going through the basement. This is the first find of such iron ingots in a hundred years in Valdrez. According to the press release, archaeologists have determined that the artefacts were iron ingots from the Viking or early Middle Ages. They've got a hole in one end and resemble long-handled spatulas in shape. They weigh roughly about 50 grams, leading experts to think they might have been a form of payment. These artefacts had been around the house since the 1980s, and experts think that somebody might have buried thousands of year old artefacts to hide them um, for later, but they never returned. The Bergen Royal Road, which is the old road between Oslo and Bergen, runs just below where Greta Marcus Sororum's father found the iron bars in Ordral in Valdrez. Iron was a very important commodity in the Viking Age, used for weapons and for travel caps and rivets for boat building. And in the large valleys of southern Norway and the areas of Trondelag, people took iron from the bogs in the Iron Age and the Middle Ages. There are few sources written about iron mining in Valdrez. It was probably a specialised job, which perhaps farmers and the little kings later owned. In the later Middle Ages, it was governed to a greater extent by the state and church. It does. I, that's what I first thought. It does look like measuring, measuring spoons. Apparently not. Unless, of course, it's measuring how much, how many cows, no, ships, whatever, how much fur you can buy. For your outfits. Rising sea levels, we are told, might have forced the Vikings out of a successful settlement. We are told the Vikings disappeared abruptly from Greenland in the mid 15th century, around 400 years after arriving there. Mandy, your cousin is from your family is from Valdrez. The original farm is from the late 1400s, still there and being worked by cousins. Well, get them to check the blinking basement. Who knows? They might have some really valuable spatulas. Hmm, excellent. The question about why this successful settlement was abandoned is it remains a mystery, and historians have never been able to fully explain it. Theories include drought, changing temperatures, social unrest and overhunting of walrus tusks, all of which would have made these colonies in Greenland economically non-viable. But now a team of researchers from Harvard and Penn State University have uncovered a, ne a new factor that might explain, explain this flight, namely a rise in sea levels. They've used a computer model based on geological and climate records to find that sea levels would have risen by up to three metres or 9.8 feet during the four centuries of Norse occupation of the eastern settlements of the, the Vikings established in Greenland in 985 AD. They think that around 204 square kilometres or 74 square miles of land would have been flooded during this period. This loss of habitable land would have been compounded by a trend for warmer temperatures towards cooler, drier temperatures in Europe, ultimately leading to the Little Ice Age. See that being raised by Crazy Artist Lady? Absolutely. Which began around 1250 AD. Sea level change is an integral missing element of the Viking story, we are told. We have analyses of human remains from churchyards and animal remains from trash piles that show that over time, the diet of these settlers switched from land-based food to marine resources. This change might have been due to the loss of land, and thus crops and livestock, and so thus the sea becomes your source of food. The idea that sea levels would rise as temperatures fall is counterintuitive, researchers say. Cooler global temperatures, understandably, are usually associated with falling sea levels, but we're told Earth's oceans aren't like a bathtub. Fair enough. And the study noticed that there was a, that the change in sea level doesn't affect all areas equally. The Greenland ice sheet 
re-advance during Viking occupation of the eastern settlement. This re-advance pushed down the land around it, something like a dent that forms around you if you sit in a waterbed. That's an interesting way of putting it. Less intuitively, the mass of ice is so large that it significantly attracts the ocean to it. The greater ice mass close to the shore um, raise the ocean, we are told. Very interesting. We are staying with Vikings. I got this. This was sent to me a lot, and I understand why. A one th- set of 1,000-year-old Viking coins has been unearthed by a young girl who was metal detecting in a Danish cornfield. What a find. She found three, nearly 300 silver coins. This trove, is what it's been called, was laying in two spots not far apart. We're told this hoard, a hoard like this, is very rare. They were found about five miles from the Firkat Viking ring fort, which is near the town of Hobro. And notably, these have cross inscriptions and they're believed to date back to the 980s. It includes Danish, Arab and Germanic coins, as well as pieces of jewellery that are thought to have originated from Scotland or Ireland. The finds were told are from the same period of the fort. That is a really beautiful coin. The two silver treasures in themselves represent an absolutely fantastic story. But to find them buried in the settlement just eight kilometres from Harold Bluetooth's Viking castle is incredibly exciting. King Harold's earlier coins did not feature a cross, so he likely introduced the cross coins as propaganda in connection with his Christianization of the Danes. Yet set that set that man to work, Yvonne, quite frankly, where are your trove of Viking coins? I mean, you've married this man, you bought him a Viking a metro detector. Where where is the Viking coin payout? <laughs> And another good point, how is this little girl going to top this? I don't know how little she is, but how is she going to top it? Or she is the luckiest metal detectorist in the world and we need to put her everywhere. I mean, you can't get the staff nowadays, can you? (laughs) We are thought there could be a link between the treasures, which Vikings would bury during war, and the fort burning down in the same period. The plan is to continue digging next autumn after the harvest. The the hope is they're going to find burial sites and the home of one of these trove's owners. Vikings believe that burying their treasure allowed them to find it again after death. The artefacts are going to go on public display from July at the Olborg Historical Museum. The girl who made the discovery is due to receive financial compensation, the amount of which has not been made public. I cannot be the only one who's hoping that that is going to go into a lovely large trust fund to pay for her education. And let's hope that that education sees her becoming a archaeologist. And then one day we'll be doing this and she will announce herself having made an incredible find. And she will say, and do you know? A number of years ago, I am the one that found these coins and this picture will come up and we will all scream in joy that this has all come full circle. I'm just creating fantasies in my own head. I'm allowed. We need to team these people up. The little I remember this, the little girl who found the sword in the lake and she's found the coins. We need like a little round table of tiny girl child archaeologists i love this for a concept what a great kids book what a great kids book would that be just a bunch like forget five go sailing five go archaeologying see see you later indiana jones i don't think so <laughs> Let's do it. Let's do it. I 
I don't I haven't I haven't yet developed I haven't called together the consortium of child archaeologists but when I when they when I do and they need babysitting Justine you'll be the first person to come to isn't that wild just send them out into the world into fields just digging up stuff and then they come home and and need babysitting and one child is finding the French bulldogs that's it so you've got sword sword kid coin kid flat face bulldog kid and one's got to be a dino kid. Got to be a dino kid, surely. Excellent. Almost certainly. But maybe that funding will go towards her buying all sorts of cool... I just hope it goes... I hope that the find gets reinvested into her being like a cool Lara Crofty archaeologist -y type. A 1,000-year-old indigenous canoe has been excavated from a North Carolina lake. The Wacomore Suian Indian tribe helped archaeologists to excavate a 28-foot canoe out of Lake Wacomore on the 12th of April, and it's thought that this canoe is 1,000 years old. This canoe was found while three teenagers were swimming during the, in the lake during the summer of 2021. The tribe in question is from North Carolina, and it's one of eight state-recognized American Indian tribes in North Carolina. They call themselves, quote, the people of the falling star because of their history near Lake, Wac near Lake Wacamore. Their oral tradition tells that this lake was created long ago when a meteor crashed into the earth and nearby waterways flowed into the crater, causing a unique blue-green appearance, unlike other lakes in the area. Wickermar Swan Chief Michael Jacobs told Fox News that this canoe supports the tribe oral history, that they have been there for thousands of years. For years and years, we've always been questioned about our history and where we come from and who we are. Now we have the physical history to back it up. Eli Hill one of the teenagers who found the canoe while swimming said that he initially thought it was a log, but he couldn't pick it up. And Hill's family contacted the North Carolina Office of State Archaeology, which then sent a team to examine the canoe and then move it under a dock until it could be safely excavated. Because, of course, you need to keep it. Wooden finds need to be kept wet until they can be properly removed and then dry, dried out. Um, According to reports, dozens of tribal citizens of the Wakamore Suan Indian tribe observed this canoe's excavation. Isn't that cool? Along with community members and other news media, the canoe was then placed in a chamber, covered and dried with towels, wrapped in plastic to prevent further deterioration. It's then going to be chemically treated in a lab so that it can be prepared for further observation. This is going to be displayed during an open house at one of the best named institutions, the Queen Anne's Revenge Conservation Laboratory in Grenville or Greenville, North Carolina. Is it Grenville, North Carolina or Greenville? It's going to be displayed there on April 22nd. So if you are nearby and want to have a little look-see, do crack on. The Last year, the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin pulled a second canoe out of Lake Mendota that is at least a thousand years old. Very, very fun. Excellent. And I'm very glad that the community was there to witness and to assist. Make of this what you will. The Mayan calendar, apparently, we uh, has finally been solved. The mind calendar works on an 819 day cycle, and this is something that's confounded uh, scholars for decades. But new research has shown that it matches up with planetary cycles over a 45 year span. A study that's been published in the journal Ancient Mesoamerica has highlighted how researchers could never quite explain this 819 day count, calendar count until they broadened their view. Quote, Although prior research has sought to show planetary connections for the 819-day count, its four-part 
colour directional scheme is too short to fit well with the synodic synodic periods of visible planets. If you increase calendar length to 20 periods of 819 days, a pattern emerges in which the synodic period of all the visible planets commensurate with station points in the large 819 day calendar, which is a lot of words to I which were confusing to me. We have an explanation of what it means. That means that the Mayans took a 45 year view of planetary alignment and coded into a calendar that's left modern scholars <laughs> scratching their heads in wonder. While these calendars offered while ancient Mayan culture offered various calendar types, the one that's baffled scholars the most is this 819 day calendar in glyphic texts. Same. Seeing this one, this quote, this comment, it's mind blowing. I can barely keep track of my laundry. I mean, look, maybe for the, maybe for these pictures, we'd all be, we'd all be there. So what does this mean? Mercury was always the starting point for the tricky timeline because its synodic period, 117 days, matches nicely into 819. From there, though, you need to start extrapolating out the 819 number. And if you chart 20 cycles of 819, you can fit every key planet into the mix. Mars might be the kicker for overall length. With a 780-day synodic period, 21 periods match exactly to 16,380 or 20 cycles of 819. This is like really hard maths. This makes my brain hurt because there's a lot of numbers. Venus needs seven periods to match five 819-day counts. Saturn has 13 periods that fit within six 819-day counts. And Jupiter has 39 periods to hit 19 819-day counts. Rather than limit focus to any one planet, the authors write, the Maya astronomers who created the 819 count envisioned it as a larger calendar system that could be used for predictions of all the visible planets' synod periods, as well as commensuration points with their cycles in the Tzlokin and calendar round. I... I'm not going to I'm not going to say that I completely understand what's happened here. What I am going to say is that part of the codes appears to have been cracked. I am going to need to find somebody who can explain this to me like I'm 5. Because this makes me feel like I'm Marianne, I don't I don't know if you're being serious asking me this question or if this is a joke. I don't is this is I don't know if this is a space funny and I've missed it or if it's a if it's a not or if it's a real question and I don't understand it. But it's so you look for a consistent planetary body and then what? Why? What's happening? That's I understand the words, but I don't understand. I don't understand if they're sharing significance of it. Oh, you're serious. I have I don't know about light years. There's no mention of light years here. So they spend a lot a lot of time looking at the sky and mapping it. My question is oh hang on, has he explained it? We would need to see it to chart it. We would need to see it to chart it. Right. So we've, we're finding out the way they've organised. What we haven't got yet is a significance as to why this is happening. Is that correct? Have I missed this? That they That they have got an idea of what they're doing, but not the why. Is that what's happening here? 
No, that's not what's happening. Okay. We use a 365 day calendar. Yes. Mayans use an 819 day calendar. Scholars couldn't figure out why until now. So they're doing it because they're charged from the planets. Still want to know. I'm presuming that that is that 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 that, that there is significance for them in including all of the planets. And I'd like to know why that that would be. I'm you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna find a, a very Oh dear. This is the chat is now far beyond my level of expertise. So is it a potentially a godlike observation? Interesting. Interesting. Successive generations have to observe these same patterns and then do them. So that's the yes, yeah, that's the thing. This is this is a thing that 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 generations are doing. I'm very I want to know what's going on. I feel like we've been told that it's been it's been solved, but only a bit's been solved. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Anyway, let's. Do you know what we have to hop on because we have more news to look at. And I will if 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 more things become clear, if I find an explanation that I can understand, I will come back and share it. Um, and we'll see. Staying with the Mayans, we have a secret ingredient that made Mayan plaster durable. And the secret ingredient is for making their own lime plasters, mortars, which they used to build their magnific magnificent structures. The teams analysed samples of plasters from Honduras and confirmed that they added plant extracts to improve the performance. It's a process called slaking. They added sap from a bark of a local tree species, tree species, chacum and giot, um, which when the lime, the umbrella term for calcium oxide rather than the fruit, is mixed with water, it's a process called slaking. A comparison of the plaster and stucco from 540 to 850 CE and those created by the team today reveals a striking resemblance. Maya masons most likely used the sap infused plaster because of its increased, increased durability, plasticity and water resistance. Since ancient times, and in some cases even earlier, plaster, cement and concrete have been used. These are now ubiquitous building materials that have been used and improved by numerous civilizations. But not always the exact recipes used by our forebears are passed on intact. Archaeologists have occasionally had to put in a lot of effort to understand how these materials were made. Our study helps to explain the improvement in the performance of lime mortars and and plasters with natural organic additives developed not only by ancient Maya masons, but also by other ancient civilizations. So e.g. Chinese sticky rice lime mortars, these authors wrote in their paper, which is published in Science Advances. We are now hopping to a period that I do understand more about. We are hopping to the news of the early modern period and some spoons. 15th century silver spoons sold at a Salisbury auction house for £47,500. Included in this 18 strong set of spoons was a pair of Henry VIII Apostle spoons, which sold for £47,500. This is what's in the title. This auction was held on April the 19th. In the second day of the auction house's two day sale of silver and objects of Vertu, which included 705 lots. We are told, quote, the spoons are quite early for our silver department, but we do have an antiquities department, so obviously we sell things that are a couple of thousand years old as well. These are apostle spoons, which means that they were not really decorative. And that they, they have a figure and apostle at each end. These feature St. Simon Zelotes and St. Philip. The spoons are not really decorative. 
these were made in London, so they would have originally belonged to an important wealthy figure and they would have been used. We are told that, quote, spoons were almost like having a passport or credit card today. They were a marker of status and certainly these Tudor ones. The dinner place setting as we know it didn't really come into existence until the 18th century. So before then, you turn up to a banquet, you bring your own spoon. The more lavish your spoon, the better your status. You have it sort of on your belt, maybe. Particularly among the sort of farming classes who had money, but who worked a fairly mucky job. If you turn up to your dinner table with filthy fingernails, but you had a silver spoon, then you were a landowner and not a serf. They're very beautiful things. And what wonderful survivors. So the whole collection of these 18 sold for £129,000. These two sold for 47 1,500. Another auction that is happening this summer, we have a portrait of Catherine Parr, estimated to sell between six thousand pounds and eight thousand pounds, and also, and I, this is the this is the portrait that is thought to date back to the fifteen forties, and was likely to have been commissioned by Henry the Eighth. It does that's a recognisable jewel that she is wearing there. That is one of the the Queen's jewels. In fact, I think I need to double check, but it looks very similar to the one that she is wearing in her full length gown. She is dressed in the full length gown portrait that is of her. Catherine Parr here is dressed in a traditional French gown with third sleeves and the, and the underneath those are false sleeves. She is wearing a beautifully decorated belt around her, a girdle. If you see those black stones, those are diamonds. So those are, she's wearing diamond and pearls um, on her gown, the full sleeves of her gown, around her girdle, around the top of her bodice. It's on her neck. It's on her hood. This is a lot of wealth is being worn here. This is yes, this is the crown shaped jewel that's worn at her worn at her chest. That is the jewel that she wears in the full length portrait of her, where she is standing on the turkey carpet, as it's called. I've got a video on that. Fabulous. And the other thing that's being auctioned is this letter. This is a personal letter that's written uh, by Catherine to her brother, and it's detailing her marriage to the king. This is written just days after her marriage on the 20th of July, 1543. She tells her brother how happy she is to have married the king quote, she says that the marriage brought her, quote, the greatest joy and comfort that could happen to me in the world. The letter was last sold at auction 40, more than 40 years ago, and it's thought that this time around it might fetch between 15,000 and 20,000 pounds. And I think it is what a lovely sale to be having. I do hope that these somehow make their way into a public collection. We've got some more techie stuff. Synchrotron, synchrotron technique is revealing more details of a mysterious underlying portrait in Renaissance painting. This one is of Cosimo de' Medici, and we are seeing this new advanced imaging technique that's being done at the Australian. That's being done at the Australian synchrotron to gain more information about the underpainting of this famous portrait of Cosimo de Medici. It's him in armour, and it's one of at least 25 known portraits of the Duke in armour. This has been put underneath this new study. It's There's been X-ray fluorescence microscopy instrument to scan the portrait with the assistance of senior instrument scientists, and a study has been written about it. XFM, as it's being called, is now an important tool for art historians and museum cur curators as it can detect and map metals in paint pigment non-invasively. So you can scan what's there and you haven't got to scratch bits off to see what's going on. We know that Renaissance artists used expensive paints containing 
minerals in parts of their paintings. These elements being mapped by this XFM top technology include mercury, which is present in the red pigment vermilion, um, copper found in azurite, uh, tin, which correlates with the lead tin yellow, the use of lead tin yellow, iron, which is in the range of ochres, manganese, which is in umber, as well as trace elements, notably our favourite flavour of arsenic in pigments derived from mineral deposits. The recent investigation established that the New South Wales Art Gallery's portrait of Duke Cosimo was the earliest or prime autograph version of the three-quarter length composition, following the primary half-length version of the portrait held in the Uffizi in Florence. The authors of the study also proposed that the image beneath may represent early thoughts for a painting that was completed on another panel, the portrait of a young man, which is now in the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City. Dr Howard, one of the members of the team, said that the Sinocraton Synocratron XFM beamline was experienced in handling invaluable artworks, including Portrait of a Woman by Edgar Degas and The North Wind by Australian artist Frederick McCubbin. So presumably we're going to have more of this sort of thing being scanned. And potentially us finding out more stuff about the way in which art is made, which is very good. There has been a new discovery on a Leonardo da Vinci folio, the folio 843 of the Codex Atlanticus. This is one of the most extensive and fascinating collections of da Vinci drawings and writings. An interdisciplinary team has been working on this. They are trying to find out the origins of some black stains that appeared a few years ago on the modern passepartout that binds the original folios together. Previous studies had ruled out that the stains resulted from any microbiological deterioration. So there's a new study, research by the Politinico de Milan. They combined hyperspectral photoluminescence imaging, UV fluorescent imaging with micro ATRIR imaging, and they reveal the presence of starch glue and vinyl glue being located in the areas where the staining was most concentrated. In addition to the presence of round inorganic nanoparticles, they uh, which had a cube, they found made up in addition to the presence of round inorganic nanoparticles. They found 100 to 200 nanometers in diameter that were made up of mercury and sulfur. This had accumulated in cavities formed between the cellulose fibers, which is sealing this and containing these important documents. Then they used synchronotron analysis conducted at the ESRF in Grenoble uh, to identify these particles as meta cinnabar which is a mercury sulfide used an, in an unusual black crystalline phase. In-depth studies of paper preservation methods have allowed the formulation of hypotheses of the formation of this meta cinnabar, and it's thought that the presence of mercury could be associated with the addition of an anti-vegetative salt in the glue mixture that was used in the Grotta Ferrata's restoration techniques that could have been applied only in certain areas of the Passepartout paper, which is where it holds Leonardo's folio. We are told that, so essentially they're trying to prevent microbiological breakdown. The presence of sulphur, on the other hand, they think was linked to air pollution, particularly from Milan in the 1970s, where levels of sulphur dioxide were very high or potentially to the additives used in the glue, which over time might have had a reaction with the mercury salts and the formation of metacinnabar particles being responsible for their, da for their black stains. We have got revolutionary war soldiers who are being slated for reburial 240 years after the battle. These are rediscovered remains of American Revolutionary War soldiers who died in South Carolina more than 240 years ago, and they are due to be reinterred 
this weekend, last weekend, in a ceremony to honour their sacrifice to the budding nation. The 14 individual skeletal remains were uncovered and excavated in the fall of 2022 at the Camden Battlefield, which is the site of a 1780 British victory during the War of Independence. The reburial of these unknown soldiers will honour some of America's earliest fallen and advance current understanding of how impo this important battlefield battle unfolded. An initial examination of the soldiers concluded that 12 of the bodies are likely Patriot Continental soldiers from either Maryland or Delaware, and one was likely a North Carolina loyal loyalist, while another served with the British 71st Regiment of Foot, Fraser's Highlanders, which is the non-profit uh, who was working on this, they said in their release. Anthropolog Forensic anthropologists are trying to craft biological profiles for each of these troop members. At least five of the Continentals were found to have been teenagers. The oldest soldier estimated to have died between the ages of 40 and 50. There are, in some cases, clear evidence of battle injuries from musket balls and buckshot. The Scottish Highlander, we are told, is the only one who appears to have been carefully laid to rest, face up, with his arms crossed. Others were found face down or overlapping each other. It's thought, based upon the historical evidence, that they may have narrowed down the Highlanders' identity. There are three potential candidates, but it's only going to be confirmed when the DNA analysis is complete. They also have found that through collecting these DNAs, that the individuals with suspected connection to the soldiers can provide help, a sample to help this process fi be finalised. The loyalist militiaman is thought to have Native American ancestry and is not part of this weekend's events. Instead, he is scheduled to be honoured in a private ceremony with local tribes. Hi, Donovan. Thank you for making it. I'm very, very pleased that you've made it down. This one is potentially a project that if you're about and you're willing, you can get involved with. This is about sandy ground, something that I hadn't heard of. And this young woman is fighting to preserve this historic community's rich history. In this article, the editor's note reads as follows. This story is part of an ongoing journalistic initiative to rally the community and the country around a critical but endangered historical site sandy ground, the nation's oldest free black settlement, still inhabited by descendants of its pioneers. This was launched during Black History Month. The work will shine a spotlight on this site's rich past and urgent needs as its historians seek to pass the torch of preservation to a new generation. There are loads of links that you can click in this article. The Sandy Ground Historical Society is in the process of a full revitalisation of its board, museum and reach. The museum, we are told, is currently in disrepair. It's got mould and water damage. It needs a new roof and plumbing. The pandemic has caused untold problems with people working there and being having to take leaves of absence. It's a non-profit. The organisation is without funding. The board now needs a new executive director to lead this process. Because the current executive director, Sylvia Moody de Sandro, is in her mid-80s and, frankly, deserves to have a break. If you can and are willing to be involved with the rebuilding of Sandy Ground, there is an email address here, sandygroundhistoricalsociety at gmail.com. So that is something to check out if you can what an interesting and worthwhile project buckinghamshire mansion is on sale if you have got a cool 75 million pounds in pocket change denham place it's got connections to the bonapartes queen elizabeth I, and wallace simpson we are told this is a magnificently opulent mansion. A hive of activity for British high society for more than three centuries has finally come to market. It's, bought on the, it's built on the former site of a Tudor mansion, which was the home of Sir Edmund Peckham, High Treasurer 
to Henry VIII. It was visited by the king's daughter, Elizabeth I, during her reign. In 1670, the owner of that time, Sir Roger Hill MP, High Sheriff of Buckinghamshire, commissioned the current mansion with formal landscape and parterre gardens around the house, inspired by Versailles. James Crawford of Knight Frank, the auction house, commented, quote, Since Anglo-Saxon times up to the current vendors, there have only been seven owners of Denham Place. Seven families? All vampires. Um, with each family, I think it's seven, seven familial families, with each family undertaking improvements, bestowing an enhanced legacy for the new owners. Alongside offering private, tranquil parkland, it's excellently connected with just, just 30 minutes from central London and Mayfair, being just six miles from airport base RAF Northolt for using private jets. Uh, short of acquiring one of the Crown Estate Royal Palaces, there is nothing of this grandeur or provenance so close to central London. Well, if you go to this website, I can see crazy arse lady certainly on the website that's linked so this this news article there are some lovely photos of the interior it does look opulent i don't know if there is a 360 tour but i imagine if you're permitted to this is the sort of place that affords a 360 tour so maybe go and check out um, beecham estate knight frank savills also you can visit denham place it's got its own uh, website. How long by carriage in central London? An excellent question. Doesn't say here. I mean, frankly, remiss. Remiss. I mean, it's quite a bit of money. 75 million. It's not pocket change for me. <laughs> Tell you that. We, what we didn't talk about is, um, people trying to change history we've been talking about that in in number of weeks and now it's part of the new news because we have this story apparently india is trying to erase two centuries of mughal rule from the history school books we are told that india's school children risk learning very little about the period in history in which the muslim mughal dynasty ruled the country a new set of textbooks, part of the, quote, rationalised syllabus by the National Council of Educational Research and Training, which is an autonomous organisation under the Federal Education Ministry, omits chapters on Mughal rulers from Indian school textbooks. Supporters of this revamp argue the Mughals have been overrepresented in Indian history, and this is part of what they call right-sizing. But having reigned the in, over the country from 1526 to 1761, this dynasty was one of India's longest lasting rulers and hence has an outsized footprint in the nation's history. The wealthy and culturally rich set of Muslim emperors have also left marks from centuries to come, from Delhi's Red Fort to Agra's Taj Mahal. That history, we are told, is being rewritten and obscured. Uh, this article goes on to say, quote, it's hardly surprising this is happening in a country that won't let kids learn about Darwin's theory of evolution until and unless they opt for biology in grade 11 or 12, because it doesn't belong to the religious orthodoxy and creation narrative. It is indeed a little hard to hide the Taj Mahal. I, I don't know how they're planning on doing that one. Uh, historian. Sechua Majahan says, quote, this present regime and its ancestors have made it an ideological weapon or tool in their political project and intellectual and cultural project of turning this country into a Hindu dominant country. And this is part of that agenda. We're told that other things that have been removed is the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi, specifically the history of his assassin, Hindu nationalist Nathram Godsi. Also references to the Hindu nationalist movement was banned after Gandhi's death. In 2002, also removed in 2002, the riots in Gujarat state, where over a thousand people, mostly Muslims, died. And this is back when the current Prime Minister of India, Prime Minister Modi, was that state's chief minister. We're continuing on. Same, same article. 
the Nehendra Modi government's attempt to push its Hindu Hindutva agenda. I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not quite sure. This feels very um, opinion based. I'm just going to point this out. The way this article is written, it's very. It's got a lot of opinion behind it. So I'm just going to flag that up. They assert that what's happening here is this is a movement that's seeking to establish Hinduism and Hindu culture as dominant in India. And we are being told this is coming at the cost of the country's Mughal history. The stories of Muslim rulers are getting distorted and discarded. Tweaks to school and college textbooks, just one part of it. The Hindu washing of names is another big nationalistic manoeuvre. So definitely worth keeping an eye on. Uh, it finishes with the following. This is a story of just one state, albeit one of India's largest and most populous ones. But similar redefinitions are happening across the country and arguably, I think, across the world. Our last piece of new news is this one, that the Pope has given fragments linked to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ to King Charles for his coronation. These fragments, we are told, form a small cross in the centre of King Charles's cross. Words from St David's last sermon are inscribed on the back of the cross, and we are told after the coronation, this cross will be shared between the Anglican and Roman Catholic churches in Wales. The photograph that we're seeing on the right is King Charles hammering the hallmark stamp of certification into the cross. These silver elements of the processional cross have been recycled from the Royal Mint. King Charles, it says here, has close links to Wales. As the heir to the throne, he held the title of Prince of Wales until he became king last September on the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II. And now Prince William has taken on that title. I have feelings about that, but that's not for today. How many fragments do they have? It's an excellent question. I mean, I suppose a cross is pretty big. These are like splinter size. So a bit. Uh, talking about the stuff that's going on in India. Yes, the, we've 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 talked about the the Florida changes. Uh, I thought about putting the Indian story in updates, but as it is a completely different state doing this for completely different reasons, albeit they are nationalistic, I felt that it was best to put it in as a new story. Although maybe, maybe political tinkering with history might become a new section because clearly we need to keep an eye on what everybody's up to because there are shenanigans afoot. Thank you. That's very kind of you. How lovely. Thanks a lot. Uh, well, let's see this. Henry asserted that he was the supreme head of the Church of England. They asserted that, in part, this was supported by an assertion that was made based upon a text they found and remembered um, that England was an empire. And empires function differently to kingdoms and principalities. So Henry doesn't call himself Pope. But in every respect, yes, Pope. And especially as he was a Catholic till the day he died. We are moving on to our ding dong section. Here's my ding dong bell, little little piddling boy. Um, and this is the one that I wasn't sure where it should go. It was sent to me as a ding dong. <laughs> So that's where I put it because I had no other ding dongs to share with you. And we all know that I love to share a good ding dong. So here we go. This is a sex god riding a dolphin. It's one of the finds that have been um, made in Italy. Brian said, Popes are elected. That's in the, indeed. But they are also seen as being the heirs of St. Peter. So in that respect, Henry not elected. No democracy. Um, but also saying I'm going to do that job 
A trove of recent finds in Italy's archaeological park, Pastium Eviella, provide insight into religious life, and among them is a figurine of the love god Eros uh, on a dolphin. There's no willy, but sex god, we, we got it chucked in there. This is part, this was found in a small temple that was first identified in 2019. These excavations that have gone on there have yielded several ter small terracotta figurines in the first months since they've resumed work after the pandemic. They found several bull heads around a temple altar as if they were placed on the ground in some form of, of devotion. A dolphin statuette found in the first, first trove of artefacts appears to be from the Avili family of ceramists whose presence had never before doc been documented in Pastum, the statement said. Excavations began at these temples in 1950, but they still thought that more things could be found there. Ancient Romans controlled the city where these fires were made around 275 BC. They renamed it Pastum from the Greek Pos Posidonia, where it had been, which I believe is related to Poseidon, would be my clue, in what had before been Magna Grecia. So that is what we have. This cute little, cute little Eros looking very innocent, um, but is a sex god. And now, friends, we are moving on to events and exhibitions. This is a in Giverny, France, I'm probably mispronouncing that. This is an exhibition called Renoir in Guernsey, 1883, and it's going from July the 14th up to September the 10th. This is in partnership with the Guernsey Museum and the Art for Guernsey Association, and it's a celebration of Renoir's stay on the Channel Islands. So this is an exhibition that you can check out. If you are there, do let us know. If you've got a little bit of time to go, do let us know what you think if you do make it there. Next up, we have got a book launch that looks very interesting. The cover is Chef's Kiss Delightful. It, the title is Let Us Now Not Boast of Our Worldly Possessions. The author, Dr. Lindley J. McAlpine, is bringing together a book about provenance and people. Looking into the lives of people and the uh, and the histories of institutions who once owned them, it tells so the people and institutions who once owned objects. It talks about the objects that are now in the collection of the San Antonio Museum of Art in San Antonio, Texas. So these are questions I think about, as it says, provenance, and so thus potentially repatriation and other things like that. So. That is one to check out. Pittsburgh Friends, Westmoreland 250. There's an exhibit opening, looks pretty fun. This is a, they've got, celebrating their story with 25 objects. Our new Westmoreland 20, 250 ob exhibit will start open for viewers on the 14th of April, with the grand opening happening on the 15th. This exhibit is inside the Kendra Gallery of Education uh, Centre and they're going to be open from 10 till 4. Now, if and I, where I have been able to find accessibility information, I have um, placed that both on the Opera pin board and also in the description box down below. So where I have found the information about that I have placed it so that this is certainly the case for the the French exhibit and I believe Pittsburgh the next one was slightly more complicated because this exhibition all of the information that I could find on the website although parts of it are translated into English all of this is in Italian so I couldn't find accessibility information or if I did I couldn't read it because I don't speak Italian but if you do speak Italian then this is the one for you what they have on display are these incredible things from the Roman period they've got dice rain gutter de decorations burial offerings all of which have been in storerooms with for 
the next few months, we're told, a limited number of visitors to the Royal Forum Coliseum or Palatine Hill can view a tantalising display of ancient statuettes, urns, and even the remarkably well-preserved skeleton of a man who lived in the 10th century BCE. I'm not a fan of remains on display, but here we are. These exhibits have all been plucked from storerooms in the heart of the Italian capital, which is one of the things when people talk about if we gave, if the British Museum gave everything back, there'd be nothing on display. The storerooms are full to bursting. And every time I say a mesh detectorist in a field in Cornwall or Chiswick or wherever else has found all of this stuff, that's either going on display. And if it is, something is going into a storeroom. So they, they are full. They're full. Uh, next up, an excellent, this is an exhibit in New York of bottoms. <laughs> or at least people from behind. So there are a lot of bottoms. So good times. This is uh, 19th East 64th Street in New York. And it's in the LGDR landmark Beaux Arts style townhouse. This exhibition is called Rear View and it'll be going from April 18th to June the 1st. <laughs> it's a lovely bottom. It is indeed beautiful. And we get to what we're getting to our last news item. <laughs> they Justine, you've got to be you've got to be careful about who you're letting in your hat in your flat. <laughs> The last news piece, this is the thing that is going to keep me from uh, hanging out with you next Monday, because the 1st of May, I start at Hampton Court Palace. They, they, we're, we're back in costume and it's very exciting. So as I have spoken about numerous times, this is the 400th anniversary of the publication of Shakespeare, Shakespeare's first folio. And Hampton Court Palace is doing a event in which a bunch of costumed interpreters will be doing something, performing a show and meeting with members of the public that relates to and celebrates the publication of that first folio, which of course is a fitting location for it to happen in because Hampton Court Palace, particularly the Great Hall of Hampton Court Palace, was one of Shakespeare's theatre. I am not going to tell you whom I'm playing because I start off in disguise, and then I swiftly reveal myself. But it's a it's a great fun. Uh, Hampton Court is a wonderful place to visit. If you are coming to the UK uh, or you're in the UK and you do fancy visiting Hampton Court for this exhibit and uh, this the not exhibit this piece of entertainment, which will be going from the first of May through to July, so we're going to be there when it's open, which sometimes it's open, check availability because sometimes it's not open on a Monday or a Tuesday, but we're going to be there when it's open, having a lovely fun time. There's also events happening at the Tower of London as well. So if you plan to come and see both, maybe you also want to go to Kensington Palace or Kew, or you want to take in one of the members tours of the banqueting house etc i do recommend looking into getting a membership because if you want to go certainly to a couple or even three sites that will work out a lot cheaper for you so do see what you can find well justine it's what i'm going to tell you is it's related to shakespeare and the first folio so we are looking at a Jacobean character. So, oh, alas, I'm sorry to miss you. So I will not be there every day. I am sharing my role with another absolutely wonderful person. But this is, I, I'm going to have lots of fun. So that is why May's going to be really busy because there are lots of Monday bank holidays. So I'm going to be there on, on those days or I'm going to be preparing for those days. And thus, we we will be, we will be uh, parted until the following Monday. What I've, what I've also been given the permission to do is 
thank you. At some future point, you hope I will tell you who you're playing for those in a different hemisphere. Now, here's the thing. Something that I have been given tentative permission to do is to do some social media stuff. So I'm going to make some short content. I'm going to generally skip about the palace having a lovely time and seeing which of my friends I can drag in to my shenanigans and I will be putting up on my YouTube shorts on my TikTok so do follow all of that stuff uh, and make sure you are following this channel please if you enjoyed this stream please do like make sure you subscribe hit the bell icon uh, it's been great chatting to you all I would love it if you would pop a comment in the comment section as well as in the live chat or an emoji. Don't all rush at once. It tends to think that if you all put similar emojis that you're doing something naughty. So let's think about what emoji we can put in. Let's make them all different. How's about we do once again our favourite historical symbol as an emoji? I would be most grateful. So yes, I'm very much looking forward to what I've got coming up. I was in a rehearsal all day today, hence why I had a busy, very busy day. I was at the palace all day, swanning around, um, and I will be swanning around in rehearsal some more this week before we start. It all kicks off in May. I'm very excited, and uh, yes, it's. I'm, I think it's going to be a good time. I do. Thus, I will take my leave of you. <laughs> And I will see you all in the my video on Friday in the live chat. And I will also check you on the Monday after next. So in between then, we will be doing some pre-records. But for now, I'm going to go and get ready to have my dinner because it's quite late for me. And we've been on for nearly three hours. Do hit that like button. Thank you, Justine, for pointing that out. I am so very grateful that you spent this time with me and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. But for now, do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye. <laughs>